Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 78 of the I Rock Knits podcast. This is going to be kind of a short and sweet one. I just wanted to give everybody an update. Um, I'm currently feeling quite a bit better, um, just really run down. I spent 24 days <laughs> um, in the recliner not knitting. Uh, I have been quite ill. Um, since the 8th of July, so I thought I would just give you all an update. I have a couple of things to share. Um, I'm still coughing some, so I'll see how that goes. Um, but right now I'm currently being treated for C. diff, and I've been through this before. So um, I'll go back to the beginning. On July 8th, I had a physical therapy appointment in the afternoon, and I, on the way home, I was not feeling 100% and I was having little heart palpitations, kind of heart flutters, and I texted, called my husband and said, hey, my, I'm having heart flutters, it's really weird. Um, I had to have make a couple stops and he's like, you need to go to urgent care. Get it checked out, right? You've, you've gone off all your medications in May, I think I told most of you that, um, and one of them was a heart medication because we thought my high heart rate was being caused by the other medication, which it was. My heart rate had returned to normal. All my other side effects had gone away, so it was a very good decision, good choice. But now it's six weeks later, I'm having these heart flutters. And so I drove um, to urgent care over at a medical center here that is not attached to a hospital, but as soon as you present with a heart issue, they bump you right into the ER and there was an emergency room there so they bumped me right into the ER and I spent about six hours in the ER that night getting everything checked out but when I arrived I started coughing and coughed and coughed um, throughout the evening but it wasn't terrible it was just like a tickle I was maybe dehydrated they gave me fluids I had a ton of blood draws heart x-ray, um, chest x-ray, uh, all, all, no fever. Um, anyway, so they sent me home with a Zeo patch, which is something that I've worn before. Um, it checks your heart over a period of time, so they tape it to your chest, it's stuck to your chest, and then they sent me home. And the next day, I was very sick. I was coughing and coughing and just couldn't, couldn't catch my breath. And um, so, of course, we start to think I may have gotten COVID. Um, and now I am vaccinated. Um, I had the J&J &J vaccination, so I only had one dose, which is what was recommended. I had no problems with it whatsoever. Um, so on Saturday, I went to the urgent care here in closest town to get a COVID test. We called and said, can she get a COVID test? Yes, come, come right in. So I went in, I got a COVID test, and then I saw a nurse practitioner, and he said, I think we should do uh, pertussis. We're seeing a lot of whooping cough and we're seeing tons and tons of this upper respiratory stuff. We're getting notes every day in our system that are not COVID um, related. It, like you don't have any of the other symptoms, but you have like one or two things. And so I went home the next day, my COVID test came back negative and I didn't really have any other symptoms other than this cough. So I was like, okay, I've caught an upper respiratory virus. That's what they thought it was. The whooping cough came back negative. And then, um, and then I got sicker, <laughs> um, sicker. <coughs> <coughs> so on Tuesday or Wednesday um, of that week, we went back to urgent care where we went the first time because the two now we have figured out are not connected. They're not in the same system and they can't read each other's charts. In the past, we thought that they could. Um, so we went um, back to the ER and I had started having um, some stomach pain and um, my side hurt and my stomach hurt. And most of you know that have been with me for a while, I did have like a bowel issue, bowel obstruction, but it wasn't, I don't know. Um, two years ago, um, we were coming home from a wedding, and I think I shared that with everyone. I ended up at the ER, um, and I have IBS and have a gastroenterologist, um, had to have had colonoscopies. Um, so we went back in, and then they did a CAT scan. The problem is you can't get in to see anyone. At, uh, there is a lot more illness, lots of people seeing their doctors because they hadn't for all of 2020, 
And then it's summer, so doctors, nurses, people are on vacation. So there is, you know, kind of more limited staffing. It's really hard. So I tried to get into my gastroenterologist, couldn't get into her nurse, called me back, talked to me about my symptoms, stomach pain, then um, tried to get into my GP, couldn't get in. So we went um, back to the ER, or, but, well, urgent care. But they boosted me right to the ER because I had previously been seen there. Um, I got two liters of fluids, although I was still drinking, I wasn't eating much, and coughing. Um, but both uh, she and then the GP, who I finally did get in to see the next day, said, we really think this is upper respiratory infection. Um, you probably pulled a muscle in your stomach from coughing, but I, I, got, I was nauseous at this time. I started getting pretty nauseous and not, not feeling well. And when you're not feeling well, you don't advocate well for yourself, right? You don't, you don't ask the questions, you don't think of the questions, you don't say to them, hey, if, if this is a pulled muscle, it does not feel like a pulled muscle, I know what a pulled muscle, if this is a muscular thing, why is it hurting on the inside of my stomach instead of just the outside? And I shouldn't have nausea with a pulled muscle, right? But they both agreed, so I went home and proceeded to just get progressively worse, lots of stomach pain, and then um, that following Sunday, I started vomiting, having severe diarrhea, um, and prior to this getting ill, I had had a bout of IBS. I'll just leave it at that for a couple weeks. That is not uncommon for me. I've had like about for a while, then I can kind of get it under control. So I had probably kind of cleaned out my system, um, but I'm still trying to get in to see my gastroenterologist. And she is mostly doing colonoscopies and isn't always in her practice. They couldn't get me in. I said, can I see anyone? Can I see a nurse? Whatever. They, uh, The two different nurses, they finally called me back and they said, you got to go back to the ER. <laughs> Like, we can't get you in, we can't fit you in. The next available appointment is September 9th. Um, I, I, they're getting a new computer system August 1st, so they have limited their appointments. They um, took away all the red appointments, meaning the emergency appointments. And um, she said, I'm gonna see what I can do to move you up. So she gets me moved up to August 25th, which is still a month away at that point, and she says, the GP's nurse calls and she said, we're really concerned about you. We think you need to go back to urgent care. The doctor's out this week on Tuesday and, on Tuesday and Friday. And I, I was just, you know, I have literally now been laying for two, two weeks and I don't really know what I have and don't really know what's going on. Um, so we went back to the ER um, and they did another CAT scan. They gave me me pain meds, which help immediately. Like both the last two times I went, they gave me Dilaudid. And then you start feeling so much better. You're just like, oh, hallelujah. Um, and the, you know, they checked everything. And basically he said, I, I, I don't know what else to treat you for. You really need to see your gastroenterologist. I said, I can't get in to see her. Um, and so they sent me home with a bunch of meds. So the first time I went, I got pain meds and coughing med or and nausea meds. Then the next morning, when we finally got in to see someone, she said, "Oh, you you don't need to take you don't need to be taking those big pain meds. You could just take it. so we didn't fill it." Then the second time we go, they give me more meds. Um, I get nausea medication. I get uh, Tesselon pearls coughing medication. <coughs> um, <coughs> the more I talk it kind of irritates that cough. It's much better. Um, anyway, so um, finally he says, I, I think you have um, C. diff, uh, Giardia, one of those Kohler, like you were sick with one thing first and now you're sick with something else. And I did get better for about an afternoon on a Saturday afternoon, two weeks in, I felt much better. And then the next morning is when I woke up vomiting so um so finally my gastroenterologist called me on her lunch she had like a 10 minute lunch and she called me and she said uh your samples came back negative but i i think this is c diff you were in the er twice 
I, and you've had it before, and I, kn I know what it is, right? Like, I had it for nine months. And if you're not aware, um, it's, you know, an in infection of your um, kind of bowel. And um, I had a stool transplant last time because I couldn't get rid of it because I had antibiotic resistant C. diff, which is becoming more common because we use so many antibiotics, so things are becoming resistant. Um, so the bottom line is it came back negative, and I know because I had several negative tests when I had it last time. I was in the hospital for nine days. I took out my gall gallbladder, and I still, and that was in December, beginning of January. Then January had, then in March I got diagnosed at the Mayo Clinic. So uh, when uh, C. diff bacteria are little, they don't sh always show up when they're baby bacteria. They have to grow up to adulthood. It's what I was told. I'm not a medical person, but I know that you can get a negative. And I said, this feels like C. diff, right? Like I'm, I'm having. This is too much information, but it's orange. <laughs> um, the smell is super foul, and there's a distinct odor. Anyone who's a nurse or doctor will tell you that they've treated C. diff people, that you, you just kind of have a sense. And I said, I, I can't say for sure, but yeah, I think it is. And so she's treating me with these multi-mega doses of antibiotics, which is ironic because that's how you get it. Um, but um, I, am starting, I started on three pills a day, 550 milligrams for 14 days. The problem with this is that you usually do start to feel better and once you're done with your antibiotic, it can come back. So I really need good thoughts and prayers around um, not having it come back. Um, finally, on Sunday of this weekend, um, I felt like I was gonna <laughs> make it. Um, so 24 days in, it was um, day 25 that I was actually sitting up um, yesterday I got dressed, I put clothes on, I walked outside and down the street a little bit. <laughs> I'm super weak, um, very, very fatigued, um, but I've lost some more weight, not the way you want to do it, but I just hadn't been eating. Um, and I just wanted to give everybody kind of an update of why I hadn't been here. I did put a note in the community forum of this podcast, so if I ever don't show up, you could go there on the page there, you know, on your bar. If you go to IROC Knits um, podcast and then there's some tabs across the top and on the community forum, people can post little notes and stuff. And so I had, I had gone in one day, I don't remember what day it was, and posted that, that I was ill. And then I, I did post on Instagram. Um, someone said uh, to me, I can't believe that you're keeping up with your Instagram posting while you've been so sick and I'm, I'm not keeping up those are auto-generated. So my tips and tricks, my Wednesday wisdom, that I do that stuff ahead of time and then po get it all ready and posted for a month and so it automatically generates. So even though it looked like I was posting, uh, that's not me, <laughs> like it's just happening in my Instagram. Um, it's just easier to spend like an afternoon getting those all set up than remembering to do it every Monday and Thursday and then on Wednesdays to remember the, because I was just missing them. So there's an app called Later, L-A-T-E-R. Um, and so if you have pictures and stuff that you wanna post over a period of time but you don't wanna like bombard <laughs> your people who follow you, you can just go in there and schedule them. For days out so that's what I had done so that's why they they were still showing up as normal um, even though I was kind of under the weather um, so here I am today uh, I am feeling much better um, you're just kind of getting me out of the shower here I did I did shower and um, ah, I just I threw on a t-shirt and thought <coughs> if I can kind of give everybody a, a little heads up to where I was at um, and what happened. So uh, three trips to the ER and one urgent care visit and doctors who are overwhelmed and super busy and, uh, and, and that's where I'm at. So thank you all so much for your well wishes. I had a lot of people get in touch. Several of you sent cards, just really, really nice of you. My husband was like, how, how do they, how do they know? Um, and some of you have gotten prizes from me before, so you know my address or things like that, but um, yeah, that's where we're at. I have been listening to a lot of audiobooks. Um, each time I went to the ER, the ER was overwhelmed with people, and it's also scary to go to the ER because you're laying there with a bunch of other sick people. Um, and so I had a long wait, and so I would lay down on one of the couches with an earbud in my ear, 
and just listened to try to pass the time because I felt so miserable. And so I do have a bunch of books that I listen to. I'm not going to do a whole um, description of each one, but a little bit and just kind of share that so that you have something other than my illness journey to listen to today. I did get have someone get in touch with me after my, well, a lot of you got in touch after the felted um, knitting a podcast that I did last time, which is episode 77, where I shared all the felted knits. So many of you have uh, felted stuff before, but someone said to me, what does kitschy mean? You use the word kitschy quite a bit. And so um, kitschy are, to me, is are things that are quirky, a little over the top, a little interesting. But here is the word that I'm talking about, uh, kitschy, and things that are extremely sentimental that they're a little ridiculous. Your grandma's paintings of big sad-eyed clowns could be politely described as kitschy. While many kitschy things are considered to be in bad taste or gaudy, there are many who appreciate the emotional overkill of truly kitschy collectibles and art. And if you're one of those people, you'll happily browse for hours in a kitschy thrift store. So it's a, it's just a adjective used to describe kind of gaudy, over the top, cute, clever little things that are, you know, that's just the word that that I use. So I uh, someone had asked me maybe right after the last podcast, and so I printed it out so I would remember to um, mention it. I I do have several other notes from people, but I'm just not going to get get to them today um the the one that i did want to share is that i follow a, a an account on instagram called upworthy and they share good things and sometimes you just need that in your feed on a daily basis but um they shared this post from someone and i had never heard of this and maybe some of you have but um, the post says, I went to the website onesimplewish.org, which specializes in providing foster kids with things they wouldn't ordinarily get. An 11-year-old was asking for a bike for his birthday, but his foster family couldn't afford to buy him one. For less than $200, I paid for the kid's new bike. Anyone can do this at one simple wish. Isn't that cool? I, I had never heard of that, and I think that that's really would give you um, a heartfelt good feeling, right? Um, to help a foster kid. Um, I know our foster system is not well managed and not well run, but that's not the kid's fault, right? And so um, I just thought maybe sharing that with you, some of you would, you know, want to go over and take a look at it. Otherwise, just follow Upworthy on Instagram for just a good feel thing. <laughs> Every day they post something that's a good thing. All right, the books that, that I read in no particular order. Um, I read the bean, I listened, they're all audio. I listened to The Bean Trees by Barbara Kingsolver. Uh, Clear-eyed and spirited Taylor Grill grew up poor in rural Kentucky with the goals of avoiding pregnancy and getting away. But when she heads west with high hopes in a barely functional car, she meets the human condition head on. By the time Taylor arrives in Tucson, Arizona, she has acquired a completely unexpected child, a three-year-old American Indian girl named Turtle, and must somehow come to terms with both motherhood and the necessity of putting down roots. It's a nine-hour audiobook, and it was really good, and I don't know how I missed that, because I think I've read almost all Barbara Kringsolver's books. Um, but it was really good. I, I highly enjoyed the story. Uh, down, depressing, yes, like sad story to start, but it's, it's uplifting in the end. Then I listened to The Love Story of Missy Carmichael by Beth Morey. And this was um, termed uh, for fans of the Elef Eleanor Elephant is completely fine and a man called Uva which I liked both of those. So um, this takes place in uh, the UK. Uh, the world has changed around 79-year-old librarian Millicent Carmichael. Though quick to admit that she often found her roles as a housewife and mother less than satisfying, Missy once led a bustling life driven by two children, an accomplished and celebrated husband, and a classics degree from Cambridge. Now her husband is gone, her daughter is estranged after a shattering argument, and her son has moved to his wife's native Australia. 
taking Missy's beloved only grandchild half a world away. Well, that makes it sound really depressing. It's not. It's very fun. She spends her days sipping sherry, avoiding people, and rattling around in her oversized, under-decorated house, waiting for what exactly. And it's quirky. It's funny. She's a character. Uh, she meets some other characters who try to lift her up. Highly recommend. Nine hours and 54 minutes. It, it was just really easy to listen to. I was doing a lot of that. Like, nothing deep. Nothing where I have to remember a lot of characters. Um, you know, and that kind of thing. I listened to And They Called It Camelot, a novel of Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy Onassis by Stephanie Marie Thornton. It was 17 hours and 12 minutes, so a really long one. And few of us claim can claim to be the authors of our fate. Jacqueline Kennedy knows no other choice. With the eyes of the world watching, Jackie uses her effortless charm and keen intelligence to carve a place for herself among the men of history. This is um, fiction, but based in fact, and it was astounding. Some of the behind the scenes information <laughs> that she shares were shocking to me. Um, I mean, we knew about you know, affairs that he may have had, um, way that she was treated, but it it is just eye opening, and it was very interesting to me. Um, they both did drugs. Um, they had a doctor who injected them um, with what see, sounds like methamphetamine. Now she doesn't have knowledge of that, but I'm sure she has backup for um, why they thought that because they were so driven um, and pushed and had to keep up and had to go, go, go and do appearances and whatever that he would give them a happy drug. Oh my gosh, it was, I was just, <laughs> and I'm not sure that that's probably not happening to other people in our world who have to constantly put on concerts and performances and, you know, politicians who have to be at another meeting and they're exhausted and they haven't slept and they were on a plane overnight and that kind of thing, right? Like, it was just really interesting. So, and they called it Camelot. Then I listened to uh, Laurentian Divide, and the Laurentian Divide um, is a part of Minnesota. And so uh, I thought that that'd be interesting. And this is Sarah Stonich, and it is uh, a Minnesota author, I think. But yeah, that's what someone told me. Yeah. Um, and this is her second book, and I didn't know that there was a sec that there was a first book totally would have listened to the first one first. It wasn't that I didn't couldn't follow it, but I did feel like I there were characters that maybe I should have known more about. Um, and this is a, yeah, kind of a murder mystery, more a mystery about what happens um, to a, a small community up on the North Shore. Uh, bitter winters are nothing new in Hatchet Inlet, hard up against the ridge of the Laurentian Divide, but the advent of spring can't thaw the community's collective grief lingering since a senseless tragedy the previous fall. What is different this year is what's missing. Rory Parr, the last private landowner in the reserve, whose annual emergence from his remote iced in islands marks the beginning of spring and the promise of a kinder season. And so it starts with that and then where's Rory and why hasn't he come to town? Yeah, it was very good. I, I will definitely go back and listen to the first one. Uh, so then I listened to The Girl with the Louding Voice by Abhi Dara, 12 hours and six minutes. The unforgettable inspiring story of a teenage girl growing up in rural Nigerian village who longs to get an education so that she can find her louding voice and speak up for herself. This was heartbreaking, triumphant, eye-opening. I did not know. I, I did not know that Nigeria was still like this. Um, it, it takes place maybe, when did it, um, I'm going to say 15 years ago, the book is kind of starts to take place up until 10, 10 years ago, something like that. Um, highly recommend. Uh, just really, boy, eye-opening about how, how good we have it 
just, yeah, it was really good. But very, very good in the end, right? You're just cheering for her the whole time to, to get out of it and move on and, and, and get her louding voice. So it was very good. And then um, someone uh, had recommended on Instagram that they had gone to the bookstore and they'd picked up this book, Oysterville Sewing Circle by Susan Wiggs. And so then I looked and he had read a bunch of other hers. I think someone's having a read along with her stuff. And I had just finished reading um, the Lost and Found book store by her bookshop by her maybe two times ago and I really liked it. And so I was like, well, this is her new book. Oh my gosh, okay, I'll go, I'll listen to it. I love it, I love her. Oh my gosh, she lives on Bainbridge Island. She's written like 50 books, Susan Wiggs. Um, and this is about a community called Oysterville in the Pacific Northwest on the ocean, a little remote, a small community, um, and a woman in New York City who is a fashion designer and her life and how it connects with the small community. So it starts out telling her story, um, the, her friends and what happens to her there and then what happens in Oysterville and the Oysterville Sewing Circle is um, specifically um, started for women who are um, in domestic violence situation in this community. Um, it's, uh, she just tells a great story. These were so easy to just listen to and lay and kind of lay on the couch, nap, kind of sleep, um, turn it back on and just have something, just somebody telling me a story so that you're not just laying there all day thinking miserable thoughts about how sick you feel. Um, 12 hours and 23 minutes, highly, highly recommend this one. And I think I liked the Lost and Found Bookshop, bookshop a, a tiny bit better than this if you have to pick. But I like this one better than, a, a little bit better than the next one that I listened to because I thought, well, I'll just listen to another one. I listened to Family Tree by Susan Wiggs, which came out in 2016. Um, Oysterville came out in 2019. And then Lost and Found came out in like 2020 or 2021. Um, 12 hours and 15 minutes. Um, and the family tree. This is about a woman who wants to be a movie maker on the Food Network, like wants to be a food movie, food show person. Um, it follows her life and uh, her going um, through high school to college and then getting that opportunity. It's called Family Tree and uh, again, really good. They border on romance novels because there's always a relationship between a man and a woman in these, um, in all of them. But there is a depth of background information and character development that goes beyond a stereotypical romance novel for me. Um, I, I, will, I think I'll just keep reading every, everything right now because that's just where my brain is at. I just need a nice story, someone to just tell me a nice story uh, while I rest. Uh, so I, that's all I have for you this week. I'm going to kind of keep it short and sweet here. Um, I am feeling much better. I just need to get my strength back um, and keep taking these mega antibiotics to kill this bugger. Um, hoping that that's what absolutely what I have and that we diagnosed it correctly and that I get over it and it doesn't come back. Um, I know a number of people have chimed in and said that they've had it and it's, you know, it's the worst. <laughs> um, but until next time. Peace.